input chemical, right? So here we showed that in each of these cases, and this is SARP enough. And how SARP, how we are determining? We're determining through fitting a, a particular equation, which is called a Hill function. Okay. And in this Hill function, you can see there is a uh, the n, which is the called the Hill coefficient, and its values must have. I mean, it has to be more than one. And in this cases, you can see uh, the n values. All the n values uh, are. Uh, more than one uh, in all those cases. But one thing I should uh, mention that it's not, I mean, it is not easy to bring because when you start from your first design, then you have to do a lot of optimization, either to reduce this kind of the leakage or to increase this kind of the sensitivity or sometimes what you call is as a, uh, uh, the digital or the degree of this uh, digitalness or the digitality and so those kind of things are uh, required for the optimization uh, but again today i'm not going to talk about the optimization uh, probably in the last class i'll just touch that how you are going to optimize that but so what we're going to talk about that what is the origin of this hill function i mean what is the biological or molecular principle behind uh, getting this kind of the sharp transition so when you know this principle, then your optimization would be easy. Otherwise, it is difficult to understand that how we are going to optimize this system. So if you, again, I take uh, something as a Hill function, if you go to the uh, Google or anywhere, you just type the Hill function and you get this kind of the curves. And you can see that as this N values, that is the Hill coefficient is increasing, you'll see more surper and surper uh, transition in the system, okay? Now what, so, so, this, so this is a mathematical equation. And this mathematical equation, what we used for uh, synthetic genetic circuits, people also use for like a receptor binding with a ligand or with a drug and so on, so on. And at the very same time, this is just a mathematical function. Now, the whole question is that how uh, in molecular level in the gene expression or in the synthetic gene circuit or in the natural gene circuit, how this linearity or this Hill function is coming. So, and this is connected uh, uh, to something which you all know, at least you heard about, and that is the transcription factor. So now if you take an eukaryotic uh, gene expression or a gene regulation, you will see in order to produce uh, one gene, I mean, in order to express one gene into an mRNA, what you need a lot of different factors, okay? So a lot of different transcription factors, a lot of other uh, enhancer and so many things need to bind in the promoter okay before it can actually start producing this uh, uh, mrna similarly if you go to the eukaryotes so let's just take a bacteria in this bacteria gene expression or gene regulation uh, it is not that difficult you don't have 50 or 75 or 100 different kinds of proteins are coming together and then it starts the, the transcription it is not happening but what you notice is that if you if you go any transcription factor again go to the google search for the transcription factor even the bacteria, what you'll see, most of them are basically either a dimer, trimer, tetramer, or in any way, this is a multimer. So all those transcription factors in the prokaryotes, all might be a wrong sentence, there might be one or two, which I do not know, but the most of the transcription factors always works in the dimer or trimer or the tetramer in the multimer form. They are never been in the monomer. So that is the simplest uh, transcription factors uh, uh, quality you will get in the prokaryotes. And we'll see that how this uh, uh, multimerization, I mean dimerization and this kind of the things are working uh, in uh, order to give this kind of a Hill function on the nonlinearity. And if you understand this in the prokaryotics, it, it will easily understand what is happening in the uh, eukaryotic system. So here I'll change uh, from my slide to uh, uh, the kind of a chalk talk again, and uh, we'll try to understand how it is happening. Okay. So hope you can see uh, this paint here. Okay. So now uh, imagine a very uh, simple situation. Let's say. This is a promoter, just a, 
and then what you have you have a gene here which is going to produce the mrna and then it will translate to produce the protein now what you need you need one rna polymerase to bind here in the promoter which will produce the mrna at the very same time most of the cases i mean in the gene when a, there is a regulation what you'll find there is a transcription factor and as i said the transcription factors are generally in a dimer or any other multimer form so this either it is hindering the uh, expression of this particular gene or it is actually activating the expression of this gene but in any cases what you will see you will see there is a kind of the uh, the dimer or uh, trimer so here i just uh, would like to just talk about the dimer okay but other cases it is would be the same now so let's imagine you are doing one experiment and in this experiment what you are measuring you are measuring the gene expression or the mrna for example it could be the protein also so it's mrna for this gene that is you are measuring and as a function of the concentration of so let, let's say i just call this as a transcription factor or tf and here what you are so here in your x axis what you have is the transcription factor concentration so when we talk about this transcription factor concentration it is definitely a transcription factor concentration in terms of the monomer, right? So this is, the, that's why the mole, I mean, how much molar, micromolar, we don't care about this dimerization uh, uh, when we just uh, calculating the concentration. So in this way. Now, imagine there is another thing we have to think about, and that is we have studied in our high school, and that is then equilibrium. So let's say our monomer which is uh, our transcription factor let's say it is a okay and this a and another a is going to give you a dimer right a2 so maybe i can just draw this is one monomer and this is one monomer and this is giving you a dimer so and 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 this is in the equilibrium inside the cell equilibrium is a I mean, it's a wrong term. Uh, I'd say it is uh, quasi-equilibrium. Maybe sometimes we'll describe why we cannot call this equilibrium, but why I'm calling this a uh, quasi-equilibrium. So let's say for the time being, just assume this is an equilibrium. So it's an equilibrium constant. Okay. Now we know again from our high school that this equilibrium we can represent by the concentration of this A2, that is a dimer divided by a square a multiplied by concentration of the a monomer multiplied by another more this a square okay now what i'm going to talk about when in your cell you have let's say you assume right it's a thought experiment just we have two monomer two a are present does this mean that two a is going to make uh, an a2 it's not right because if it if, if we just allow this just 2a into a cell and in this 2a uh, is going to make an a2 so and then your a2 amount is uh, something like so one molecule of the a2 and your a is zero that means equilibrium constant is equal to infinity right if this is going to happen it never happens because equilibrium constant is never an infinite it is a generally a finite number and we know uh, the range of uh, some unit right which basically says in order to get one a2 you probably need uh, let's say you may need 10 a to get just one a2 or maybe 13 a to a2 or a 20 a to get an a2 and it depends on what values it depends on the values of the equilibrium constant so which basically means now so let's say that here instead of a concentration if i just put as a number one two three four five six seven eight like this okay so you give one a cell one monomer into the cell let's say we have this kind of uh, way we can do this kind of experiment inside the cell i just put one molecule of a so one molecule of the a will not produce 
any dimer, so it cannot bind with the promoter. So what you will see in the manner, it is zero, right? No, because gene is not expressing, so it is zero, right? So now you give another A. So now there are the two A's in the cell, and two A cannot make an A2, so you'll see another zero. So probably when you get it around the 10 A, you will get one A2. That one A2 has now the probability to bind with the promoter. That means for the first 10 A, you will get a completely flat line. Only after this, you will start seeing there is an increase because now you have an A2 which can bind to the promoter and now it starts the gene expression. So that's why. And now if you increase the A concentration, so you'll see something like that. And after a certain time, it will uh, basically saturate because now you have uh, enough A2 to uh, connect with the promoter. You cannot increase, uh, I mean, if all promoters are busy in that way. So that means if the, that's why, if this is the giving a dimerization, that's why you'll see that there is a this kind of uh, situation, sigmoid kind of shape. The very first thing, there is no gene going to be expressed. And then when you get start getting the dimer, then you can see that gene is going to get expressed. So this is the origin of the nonlinearity. Origin of the nonlinearity. So it, in the prokaryotes, it's the dimer, trimerization, those kind of thing. And in the eukaryotes, there is a lot of transcription factors. So there is the, this, these things are much more complex in that way. So you need a lot of things to be there in order to just to get a uh, gene expression. So at least in simply, we can understand from the prokaryotes that how this uh, uh, nonlinearity is originating. So when you understand the principle, then we can engineer inside the cell that how we can actually increase this slope of that. So we'll come to the optimization in the next week. The, when we talk a little bit of the optimization, how we're going to optimize that. Okay. And so this is, uh, so, so, okay. So this is the idea. So now if you think in the gene expression, instead of the dimer, if it is can possible with the monomer, you from the very beginning, you should have seen like increase, like a linear kind of the thing you should see, because if there is a one A and this, if this A can actually activate this promoter, you will see the gene in going to express and that will see uh, uh, linear, but you never see linear relation when the uh, in gene regulation, you most of the time you will see there's a nonlinear relations and this is coming. That is the molecular, uh, uh, there's the molecular reasoning that why you are getting this nonlinear. So now, so today's class, I'll just actually uh, go back and forth with the slides uh, as well as uh, uh, as well as this kind of the writing. Okay. So now I'm again uh, going to the slide a little bit. Okay, one moment, please. Sir, please share the screen, sir, not the application. Oh, oh okay. Um, one, one that you want because. Oh, so I, I, okay. So I think now you could not see this whiteboard, right? Because when I was actually oh, doing all, now it is visible. Now it is okay. Sorry, I'm very sorry that I didn't understand that it is not visible that time. Okay, I so, think so okay. if you can just revise this concept again, maybe that this will be helpful. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, sure, this, sure, uh, sure. It would was not actually visible. Sure, sure, sure. I, I'm doing that again. Yeah. Okay. So. Okay. So now, what I was drawing here is basically now you imagine uh, you have a promoter, right? And in this promoter, there is an allergen polymerase, and this is going to produce the gene when there is a transcription factors are present. And these transcription factors are present only when they're in a dimer form, 
Okay, I mean, it can bind to this promoter only when the uh, transcription factors inside the cell will be in the dimer form. Okay, then only the expression of the gene is possible. Now, imagine a situation, a thought experiment you want to do, where you just add a single monomer of A into the cell, right? And that single monomer cannot bind with the RNA polymer, uh, sorry, uh, the RNA polymers of the promoter, so it cannot transcribe the gene. Now you give a 2A, right? The, just 2A into the cell, right? So in theoretically, this 2A can make a dimer of A, and that dimer of A can bind with this promoter and it's going to produce the gene, but that's not going to happen. Why it's not? Because we know something from our high school that there is something called equilibrium constant. So if there is a A and A, these two uh, uh, molecules are coming, the monomer are coming together, it's probably giving a dimer and this is go through an equilibrium constant. Now, if you want to write the equilibrium constant in terms of a form, in terms of the concentration of the dimer, as well as in the uh, monomer, it will be concentration of the dimer, that is A2 divided by A square, right? Now, when there is a 2A, it never going to give you a 1A2. Why? Just if you put these values here, so this A2, let, let's say we have two A's, and just two A, just two monomer, two number, right? And that going to give you a one A two, right? And if there is a one A two, that means this is one, and and A at this moment is nothing present because all these two A's are going to come together and makes this two. So this A is zero, which is equilibrium constant is going to be infinity. That's not the case is happening, right? That's not the case. So how? See, this is determined by the K equilibrium, which is not the infinite number, but this is a finite quantity. So which basically means there's a possibility. So, so, so what is actually happens, so probably when the 10 A's are present inside the cell, then you probably get a 1A2. Or if you have 13A, it, you may get 1A2. Or if it's a 20A, you may get 1A2. And that depends on the values of this equilibrium constant, right? So now let's, you have done an experiment, you measurements, on your gene expression and what you are basically uh, uh, plotting in the x-axis you plot the concentration of this a as a, i just wrote as a transcription factor and in the right and the, uh, the y-axis you actually wrote the mrna of the gene okay now what will happen now instead of concentration just think this as a number so one uh, number of transcription factor or one number of a two number of a three number of a four five six something like that so as long as this is just presents as a monomer, this cannot bind with the promoter, no mRNA will produce. So what you'll see that it is always like a flat region at this beginning, and you'll see it's zero until there is enough concentration and then transcription factor start building the dimer. When the, you get some dimer, that dimer will bind to the promoter and the gene expression will start. So that is why you will get a, horizontal region at the beginning, almost at the zero, and then you see there is a increase in the concentration of the uh, mRNA. And this gives, you can see, it is a kind of the, giving this non, uh, sigmoid kind of the behavior, right? But if it is possible that uh, only monomer can activate the promoter, then you have seen, because even there is a one monomer, you start getting some mRNA. If it is the two monomer, you start getting some mRNA. So you could have seen a linear relationship. But as a dimerization is required, or trimerization or multimerization is required, you'll never see this kind of the linear relationship, but you always see this kind of the relationship. So that is the molecular origin of the nonlinearity in this kind of the gene regulation of the expression. And in synthetic biology, we actually tap into it, right? And now when you understand that why, how this nonlinearity is uh, approaching, in this system, then you can actually increase uh, the slope of this system. Then we'll talk about, as I said, in the next week in the uh, in class in optimization. Now,
Yeah, so now I'm coming again uh, in my power presentation and what so, as I said in the last two classes, that this is an important picture in terms of the complexity of the biological system. And in the right hand side, where I showed that it's a simplified representation of a bimolecular network of the bacteria. So, we talked about the nonlinearity a little bit, how this nonlinearity is happening uh, in the gene regulation. And feedbacks means uh, when we have the circuit, we'll come again uh, on the circuits. And there is another important term we haven't touched yet, and that's called the noise. Okay, and we'll see that what we uh, what the noise means. Noise in in very simple term, noise means the fluctuation in the gene expression, and that actually going to give an enormous level of uh, uh, phenotypic uh, variability uh, in biological system, right? And we'll show. Uh, one example here. So this here, there are the two examples are shown. In the A, in the picture in the top panel, this is the thumb impression of two identical twins. Thumb impression of the two identical twins. And in the bottom panel, what you'll see, this is uh, this small cat is actually cloned from this mother cat, right? So now in both of the cases, the they can they have the same genetic information. Yet, you will see there is a difference either in the thumb impression of the identical twins or even in the cloned cat, you will see uh, uh, the color of their uh, back that the, uh, or the skin or how the, uh, the arrangement of the spots are different between even in a cloned cat. So, why these differences are coming when if you have exactly an identical uh, uh, genetic information? and scientists believe that is coming from the noise so that what is the noise is uh, developing in the gene expression level that is getting propagated and that is manifested in the whole phenotypic things okay so now we we'll again go to the uh, 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 paper and uh, pencil and then try to explain that's the origin of this noise a little bit and here there are two terms uh, people use at this moment to uh, uh, explain the noise. One is the intrinsic noise, another is the extrinsic noise. So, intrinsic noise is uh, when everything is the same situation, still there is a, some difference between this. So, I, I'll define it in terms of. So, let's say imagine you have two genes, gene one and the gene two. They're present in the same cell. Okay. So, that environments are the same for that particular two genes. Still, in this expression, you'll see there is a difference. Even there, producing from the same promoter. So that difference in the intrinsic noise for this particular uh, gene. And now imagine that the same gene you now put in the two different cells and you still see there is a uh, difference in the expression level between the two cells. And this is coming because the uh, environment of the two cells are different. And as the two cells are different, you'll, that is, uh, as, uh, this is called actually extrinsic noise. And we'll first go to the exactly what is the molecular origin uh, of this kind of the noise. So, again. Okay, I hope now this board is visible. Okay, so now again we'll go something what you know about the chemistry in your high school chemistry. Okay, so in high school, what we have studied is let's say radioactive decay kinetics, right?
radioactive decay or kinetics of radioactive decay. And now we use a simple equation and that is something like this. And it has its usual meaning. N means that number of uh, uh, that radioactive element uh, present at a time t. N0 is the what the number we have started at a t0 uh, is the exponential and the k is the uh, rate constant of the decay or the decay constant and t is the time, right? So that is, so now chemically, it is a similar to as in first order reaction. So if you have a, it is a chemical reaction instead of a nuclear reaction, you probably, know that Ca, where is the A is your uh, 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 reactant, which is going to give a product. So that A Ca is equal to Ca0 e to the power minus At. Everyone has a similar kind of the meaning. Now, if we just do a little derivation here, not the derivation, just put something here, and we come to an, another definition, and which is called a half-life. You know about the half-life. So half life you can actually uh, can show we can show it is a log of 2 uh, base e divided by uh, this rate constant or the decay constant and this is 693 uh, by k so k is a number this is a number so we'll get at the t half as a number okay now imagine is now do a thought experiment what is the thought experiment let us uh, again, this is a thought experiment. It's probably not possible actually to do that experiment, but this is a thought experiment. You take 100 atom of one, this kind of uh, radioactive element, okay? Just 100 atoms. Let's say you have this capacity to take this 100 atoms. And now we allow first half-life, okay? Let's say this half-life is one second probably. So in the, it is the first half life is the first second. And what you will see, you will see after one second, you will see there is a 50 atoms are present. Now you allow another second, your monitor. So it is the second half life, right? So it is a two second from this, if it is the zero, then it is two second. After two seconds, what will you get? There's a 25 atoms are present because others are got decayed. And then after third half life, that is the three second, you'll get 12.5. Now, as every second you'll go, you'll get fraction, nothing but fraction. Now, this is a little, per I mean, perplexing because we do know that there is nothing called a 0.5 atom. Though we know the atom can be uh, broken down that we know from, again, from the high school, but that doesn't mean there's something called 0.5 atoms. And later, what you will going to then, then this 0.5 will going to be 0.25, then this point something, something. So everything, if you go till, uh, you try to go to the infinite time till zero, you will always get a fraction, always get a fraction. And we know there is no fractions atom are present, or there is no meaning of that. Then what is the problem? Why we are getting something like that? when this half-life, this is already derived from something, a, a very known rule that the first order kinetics, right? So what is the problem? How do we explain that? So it is easy to explain because the rule, when we actually, when we study something and we talk about the rule, probably we don't look what is the nature of this rule. So this law is a law of mass action from which this first order uh, kinetics uh, actually started. That law of mass action or this law is nothing but a statistical law, okay? So it is nothing but a statistical law. Okay. So this is a statistical law, which this statistical law means this doesn't mean that after half one half life, this is going to be 50 atoms. 
the possibility that you start from the 100 atom after first half life instead of 50 it is just 32 atoms and after second half life not necessary it has to be 16 there are possibility in the second only two atoms decayed and you got 30 right but how let's say imagine that probably we have all uh, all indians probably we all uh, uh, played in our childhood and that is called ludo right and ludo has something you have a dice you have a die one die you need required you don't need uh, dice like the others it's just one die which has the six faces so now and the six there is a point six which is very important in the ludo because that six if you play it, your turn comes and you get six then you can start your token right and at the very same time there's a very important things that uh, at least in our rules probably it is the same throughout the india that if there is a three six you get consecutively then your turn actually got cancelled turn means this your six got cancelled and that is a very frustrating thing now the question is if you calculate in terms of the probability so in each of the time when you throw a die your probability of getting a six is just one sixth right so but you get three sixes many times this many times you got three sixes okay and that is the fun of the game so how it is why it is happening because it is a probability it is the probability so while the probability or the statistical laws work only you have a huge amount of samples which basically means let's say the same die you are throwing six thousand times if you throw these things as a six hundred thousand times probably around thousand times you will get six so that means but when you have just six times that doesn't mean that one time would be the six there's probability that all the six times would be six it could be uh, zero time would be the six it could be three time would be the six because in any statistical law if the number of samples are increased then the statistical laws are valid more valid but if it is in the small number of the cases this kind of the statistical rule does not hold right and that is now if this is the case then it is a dangerous thing from the gene expression why because in gene expression you have one gene you have probably five mrnas we have probably 10 proteins right so all numbers are not very big very small numbers so the law of this kind of the first order kinetics and the second order kinetics or those kind of the kinetics is very difficult to use at that level right so there's a, because there is a probabilistic so one gene does not mean after one second is going to give you one protein it could give two protein or it could be zero protein we do not know uh, because it is the highly probabilistic and this probabilistic has an effect on the cell so cell has a very different way or the whole biology has a different way to how they actually mitigate this kind of uh, noise or the fluctuation so this is a very inherent fluctuation this fluctuation you cannot change by uh, uh, changing your temperature changing your other conditions you keep everything so still it doesn't matter because this is the nature of the probability and this is this stochasticity is very inherent to this system but biology use this kind of system for their own good but many times they have their own way to actually mitigate this kind of the noise and that's why the dimerization or the origin of the nonlinearity is probably one of them how imagine so there is uh, uh, i'll come later but just uh, uh, so let's one gene expression Let's, let's say there is a gene which is toxic or lethal. Like in the lysis and lysogeny switch, you will see the CRO gene expression of the CRO gene is the lethal for the bacteria because it will kill the whole bacteria and then bacteria will be destroyed. Right. Now, there is always a thermal fluctuation happens there's a lot of and we know that if there is a change in the uh, temperature there is a rate constant change and many things could be changed even our dna if it is gets uh, uh, like heated there is some part of the double stranded dna will come as a single stranded dna that has an effect on the cells and that is happening all the time now if you in a gene expression if your transcription factor would be the monomer any time due to any fluctuation a monomer can be produced let's say two monomer has been produced or five monomer has been produced 
if this five monomer has been produced and your gene expression depends on the monomer, let's say uh, five CRO gene, uh, CRO uh, mRNA or CRO protein has been produced at any point of time, this CRO protein would able to stop the other uh, uh, the C1 cycle and going to actually kill the cell. That's the possibility. So this fluctuation always can happen. This dimerization actually helps to reduce this fluctuation, which basically means that you need this CRO to first make a dimer and then it can go there. So that means if there is a five, due to the fluctuation, if there is only five CRO produced, that five CRO cannot do, uh, do anything to the cell, okay? Because this five CRO is not going to produce one CRO dimer. So when, if we have an enough amount of the CRO, which is going to produce at a certain moment that happens in the cell cycle, and then the CRO dimer is coming, that is stop the lysogeny, and that's try to kill the cell. So, so this dimerization you can see is kind of a way or the weapon to actually, uh, uh, or give the robustness to the biological system against this kind of the fluctuation. So this fluctuation is therefore very important when we actually design a synthetic genetic circuits. This kind of the fluctuation has been taken care of by the evolution, but when we design a synthetic genetic circuits, you actually build it, you test it, the evolution is not present. So here is a human design. So as a synthetic biologist, you have to actually think about that how to deal with the noise. Okay. Now, uh, <clears throat> I'll go again uh, to the slides. Okay. So now you can see this is going to tell you that what I already uh, talked about that inherent or uh, uh, extrinsic and intrinsic noise. This is just a different kind of the representation at the single cell level and at the, with the time at, uh, and at uh, when you have a lot of cell population. So that how it looks like. This is just a cartoon at the various way. And in, when you have a lot of different kind of the cells, so let's say here is the expression of the two genes, gene uh, one and the gene two in a single cell, and uh, the protein abundance, and that may look uh, like this when you actually see the time series of the um, so many cells. Okay, and similarly here is the another two uh, one another uh, way to look at. Even there is you see there is no uh, change in the gene expression for a particular gene inside the cell. If there is a variation like this, but the two, the green and red are just superimposed. But when you have a, these two genes are expressed on a population of cells, you will see there is a variation. And that is the measure of the noise, okay? So that is going to happen uh, all the time in the uh, biological systems. And this has a lot of uh, different kind of uh, consequences. And the consequences, uh, it also happens in the genetics. It happens in, uh, those noise will propagate through this all kind of a cell signaling process and phenotypically you can see that and sometimes for example sometimes people believe that uh, uh, our nose has a different kind of the receptor expression for a particular uh, uh, smell and this uh, uh, receptor expression probably is different in different person and this uh, the difference is probably coming from the noise so maybe one person is uh, more uh, sensitive to a particular uh, uh, smell than the other. And that is probably, we don't have enough proof that to tell that is exactly the result of the noise. But what scientists think at this moment, that is probably uh, due to the receptor expression, uh, difference receptor expression of the, uh, of the noise in the receptor expression in the nose. That is just uh, one uh, theory. Now, our goal is not to explain what is what this noise is doing in the natural biological system, but what we'll do in your uh, synthetic genetic circuits. So here is a uh, here is a synthetic genetic circuit you can see, and and you are expressing it's an E. coli, right? So now 
Now, when you are doing your measurements, you are not measuring a single E. coli cell. Instead, you are doing is the populations of the E. coli cells. So you may have a 10 million E. coli cells in your test tube, which you are uh, measuring for a uh, particular circuit. So the, and that means there is even there is a single gene. If you give uh, some particular kind of the inducer, your AND gate or something, and then that particular EGF is expressing different in different cells. Now, how will we measure that? We generally measure through the flow cytometry. So here is an uh, uh, flow cytometry experiments you can see here. What this so this is in the x-axis you can see this is the fluorescence you are measuring and what is this histogram is giving histogram is giving is basically a fluorescence value for a particular cell because in the flow cytometry you uh, send the cells and it goes through the your liquid channel and then you uh, shoot a laser and such a way that one cell is coming down at a time and then you shoot a laser and each cell and when it is coming it is giving the fluorescence so you you measure the fluorescence of the each cells, but in a high throughput way, probably you are measuring for the 10 millions of the cells. So you'll get a histogram that how these fluorescence are happening. Now here, you'll see what is very important in these cases, when you're measuring your situation, let's say uh, at a certain situation uh, here. So this is, these three are some input cons, it's an AND gate and these three uh, uh, situation, there should not be any fluorescence expression, whereas in the one one case there should be one fluorescence expression, and what you are uh, seeing here. Now you'll see that in terms of the JP fluorescence, they are separated, and they don't have enough overlap. If even the, I mean, mean is somewhere here. If you take the mean in an uh, uh, some other measurements like an ensemble measurements like in spectrophotometer or a fluorescence uh, a plate reader. If you measure, you measure the mean of millions of the cells. And in that case, it, it looks like it's nothing but uh, uh, your average is here and average is here and it looks separated. But actually, if you see, take the single cell data for the millions of cells, they are not that separated, right? There's some overlaps. So this, the whole idea of the synthetic biology is to actually reduce this variability. So there won't be no overlap. Overlap means then your millions of the cell, there are some cells, either they actually, even when they should not produce the EGFP, they are probably producing EGFP, or when they should produce the EGFP, it is not producing. That overlap means that, right? So you cannot decide in an, uh, in an ensemble level, I mean, uh, in a population level cells, which cells are working in what condition. So this is very, so the overlap here, should not be there. So here is the you see it's a very minimal overlap because this fluorescence and this fluorescence are very little amount of the uh, cells is in the out layer. But sometimes when you start doing your uh, synthetic genetic circuits, probably this group also, when they actually started their experiment, they probably found at the very beginning these things actually overlap. So this uh, green thing probably come in the left side, and this the two. Uh, two histograms overlap together, which basically means there is a lot of noise in the system and you cannot differentiate between an, I mean, uh, a zero condition and a one condition properly. So your goal is to actually increase this kind of uh, separation. So it means you are reducing the variability. So there is a many methods uh, uh, are there. Uh, we don't have the time to discuss uh, and, but one simple way people actually show that you can change the cell strain uh, to reduce the noise. Uh, another way to, I mean, if you really find that something you see a lot of noise are happening, you just uh, throw out that experiment and start from the beginning. Some others take the other cell strain and see if it is happening. Uh, and But there is a lot of feedbacks you can give to reduce the noise. And those are the uh, other subjects uh, maybe we can discuss uh, uh, some later time. Okay. So now, where we'll uh, go. So, so, so this here, I just tried to give you an idea. What is the uh, origin of the nonlinearity in a gene regulation, which we are going to use uh, for developing your synthetic promoters for the gene circuit or logic gates. At the very same time, what is the origin of uh, noise in the biological system, especially in the gene expression, and how it is going to uh, uh, kill uh, your genetic circuits and then you have to how will you measure it and you need to do but we haven't talked about how we're going to uh, 
do that that is now what are we going to do so till now what i mean starting from my first lecture uh, again this is not a full course of the synthetic biology this is just the introduction what i tried to give you an idea and the very beginning the what is the level of applications as possible uh, potential application is current applications and the future applications which so probably uh, not going to possible through the conventional genetic engineering and so and then we just talk about some of the inner fundamental uh, laws some kind of the mathematical modeling and those kind of things uh, just to give an idea now we'll see so synthetic biology is when you talk about this engineering it is not always just an engineering i mean just just for the applications there is a lot some other goals right and uh, so uh, 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 now one of the important factor i should also mention that in the synthetic biology at this moment, we are trying to apply the electronics principles. As I, again, I told in the uh, last class, that doesn't mean that is the biological rule and that's how the synthetic biology will go for next 50 years. Probably we'll find some fundamental rules from the biology, a real engineering rule, and we, based on that engineering rule, we'll uh, develop a new biological systems. But at this moment, we'll just take the electronics principle. So when you take the electronic principle at a circuit, if you see in here, it's an electric circuit, these circuits are connected. So means, when you want to develop inside the cell, you have to connect one gate with the another, right? And that means if you want to develop a very complex function, you have to connect a lot of this kind of logic gates. That is called, and the way it is due is called the hierarchical uh, electronic design principle. You're connecting the, by layers, lot of genetic circuits, I mean, lot of electronic circuits, you're connecting one by one consecutively by layers. So you're layering those circuits, right? So if you want to follow that the same rule, in uh, uh, synthetic biology in inside the cell then you have to also use this kind of the layering so right so we'll show one example of that kind of layering so people developed the hop adder or hop adder uh, logic device in bacteria so uh, uh, i think in the first class i talked about the full adder that's happened in the mammalian cell but here is the hop adder. So what is the hop adder? So, I mean, if you add two hop adders, you'll get a one full adder. And this adder is the part which uh, uh, add numbers in the arithmetic logic unit of a computer. So here, uh, it is like happened like five years or six years back, this uh, paper is published. And here, they developed this hop adder. And you see there is a, a rule, right? This is, a, this is a layering. So it's a one AND gate. Now this AND gate is uh, its output is now connected with a NOT gate. And this NOT gate's output is now input of an AND gate. Similarly, you have an OR gate, its OR gate's output is also one input for this AND gate. And then what you, uh, then you have uh, something here, you're getting uh, uh, the, your output. This is the truth. So means in biologically, they also developed these uh, two AND gates and one NOT gate, one OR gates connected exactly the same way and what they actually developed in an adder. And uh, let's just tell that uh, when it is definitely uh, easier saying than doing it because in each of the cases, you have to uh, think about that's digital, the noise and everything, you have to actually uh, take care of all of them. But even they are able to do that, but this has happened in 2015, Till now, nobody actually could develop a full adder in single cell. Okay, the mammalian cell I and mean, bacteria, I mean, mammalian cell, I'll come, but this is not exactly like this. So why it is impossible to make even in the bacteria? The impossibility is coming because layering of this genetic gas in single cell is difficult. This is because not only you need a lot of different genes together, but at the same time, you have to match the kinetics. So the kinetics of an, a biological AND gate has to connect with the uh, another biological NOT gate. And this connection, this kinetic parameter, it is not, it is a human design. It is not tuned by the evolution. So it is extremely difficult. So even we cannot make a full adder, okay, by layering this kind of the circuit. So what synthetic biologists thought is again coming from another computer uh, principle, and this is called distribution computation or distributive computation. Okay, and what so this is a definition from the IBM. What how they define this? A distributed computer system consists of multiple software components that are on multiple computers but run as a single system. So if you have a 
you want to have a computer, but this computer not a single computer. There is a lot of computers connected, but not a not that lot of uh, uh, independent computers connected. The whole idea is that all computers together working as a single computer. That is different than the 10 computers. You have a work and you distributed your work in the 10 computers and getting the things that that is different than this, because here all the computers are working together as a single computer. That is the whole idea of the uh, distributed uh, computing system or distributed computation. OK, so in this way, you actually share the loads. And that is one of the thing what synthetic values would like to use in their study. And what, uh, so uh, so what here in 2011, that is the first distributive computing actually shown, that here you made a simple XOR gate. Okay. So this XOR gate, you can see the, the table here, the truth table. This, instead of making it in a single cell, you distributed its component circuits in four different kind of the cells. So here the three NOR gate are connected with a buffer to give you the actual uh, behavior. So when you actually distribute it means, so this NOR gate is going to produce, this is a cell one where it is going to produce a, uh, um, a protein uh, and that protein is going to produce on metabolites or a quorum sensing molecule. That quorum sensing molecule is now fed to the other two cells which can take that quorum sensing molecules and then as an input and then it uh, in process the information produce another quorum sensing molecule which is being taken by the cell four the two or three whatever they produce taken by the cell four and it is going to give you a uh, reporter protein or whatever so this the whole so not i mean if you take any of this cell this is not going to work as a xor gate you need all the four cells together to use an xor gate Right. So now that each of this, the, the work has been distributed among the four cells, but together to, the, to get the XOR gate, you need to gather all the cells together. Right. So this is a, uh, an example of the distributed computing, but it's a very simple uh, thing. So, I mean, people actually develop the XOR gate in the single cell too, but this is the, just to show that the distributed computing is uh, important because you, you can do it by the distributed computing in 2011. Now, here comes what is the mammalian adder, which I actually, uh, I have been shown in uh, uh, last uh, two classes also. Now we can see here, the circuit is too complex, just even looking at that, right? Now you cannot put, at least we don't have this technology to put so many genes uh, together. I mean, we have the technology to put so many genes together, but we do not have the technology to optimize the such level of uh, 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 complexity together to match the, all the kinetic parameters from one to this, because this layering is important. So we cannot do that very easily. So that's why nobody developed a full adder in a single cell, not even a mammalian cell. So in this, the paper, what they actually developed, they use that the, again of the concept of the distributive computing, where uh, they actually divide the function among uh, nine different cell populations. So engineered the different. So so if you so if I go here, so all these circuits, these circuits are there, but probably this part is one cell, this part is another 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 cell, this is another cell in this way. So these so nine different kind of the cells. The engineer in such a way they are connected with this chemical wire means there's some kind of the chemicals chemicals uh, uh, they're producing by one cell that has been taken by the other cell as an input and when you have a three-dimensional cell culture like a tissue this all nine cells are working together as a mammalian cell adder okay this is the mammalian cell uh, um, adder so that is one of the uh, important uh, example of the uh, distributed computation uh, in synthetic biology. And uh, uh, many people, including myself, do believe that uh, distributed computing is the uh, uh, next course of the synthetic biology thing. Instead of uh, doing everything in the sin single cell, probably the distributed computing is the uh, important to do the synthetic biology. So here, we saw one example from our work, our very recent work, where we apply this distributed computation because till now what 
I mean, people try to develop, including our lab, that always you develop some device, a very complex device like this adder or something, you try to uh, develop those kind of the, uh, complex devices to show that how you can actually build such kind of the complexity in the biological cell. But that is, again, is a device. It is already known in the electronic device. What we chose that can we actually take an abstract computation or a mathematical problem and then use the bacteria at the distributed computing to solve it? To do that, we have taken a, a problem which is always, uh, which always like uh, excites the human culture and that's the mage solver, right? Solving the mage. So if you have a, a mage something like that, you have to come from here and you have to find a way to go out here. And here you can see that's probably you have seen the Harry Potter in the Goblet of Fire. And this is called the Twizzard Maze. That is much more difficult. There is a lot of things that are happening. So that's again, so this is, it is not just simple human. I mean, it is the human culture. That is why in the Harry Potter shows, uh, there is a mage uh, solver. There's a mage runner. There's another movie. So, 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 so human culture is actually very much interested about the mage. But a human brain, for a human brain, it is easy to solve a mage. But if you think about, if you give this problem to a rat or to a robot, it would be very difficult for them to solve a mage. Okay. Now, so how, so here, what we tried to develop an engineered set of engineered bacteria, the work has been distributed in such a way among this bacteria, it can solve a mage. Okay. So here we took a very simple mage and here we, so let's say it is a two by two mage. So this is two by two mage. Here is the, your starting point and D is your destination. Now, if there is no obstruction in anywhere, so from this, if you see here, from the start to the destination, you can directly go from this part and that part. Whereas if you think about this mage, where from S to Rexena, here there is obstruction. So you can come from this S to D. Okay. Similarly here, here is the obstruction. So you have to take this pathway from S to D. Now, if you think about this one, the source, there's no path because source is already blocked. Okay. Or here, here source is blocked, there's no path. So here there's no solution. So if you use this, just a two by two grid mate, so there is possibility, there are 16 different possibles, possibilities are there. In there, there are three have the solution and other 13 have no solution. Now, if you give this problem to computer, how this computer will solve it? First, computer will abstract this as a mathematical problem. To do that, they use something called a problem matrix. What is going to say is if you take uh, 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 a matrix like, uh, uh, for example, uh, 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 let's say this one. So zero means that there is a blockage. One means it is open. So your problem is zero, zero, one, one, right? But your solution, it doesn't have a solution because even this is too open, source is blocked, so you cannot come to the destination. So solution matrix should be 0, 0, 0, 0. So this way, mathematically, for a computer, mathematically, you represent the problem matrix and the solution matrix. So it is nothing to have the device, right? It is nothing to do with this is a computational problem. You are putting it as a mathematical way. And what we thought that when if there is a matrix, we can actually want to develop this matrix at the truth table. And through synthetic genetic circuit, we can solve this truth table. So we put this as a truth table where your problem matrix you can generate by using four different chemicals. Means we have taken four different chemicals. And if you have a 0, 0, 0, 0 kind of a problem matrix, because there is no uh, 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 there is no open space, which means these chemicals are not present, which means I'm just going to give you, this is the problem. But if you come here, uh, for example, here, that means there are three chemicals will be present, one chemical won't be present, right? So this way you can develop a problem matrix and your uh, solution matrix could be in terms of four different fluorescence proteins. Now we engineered a set of bacteria who can take these chemicals and produce this fluorescence uh, uh, protein based on this truth table. 
or basically this mathematical matrix. So do that, we develop a circuit. Now, if we want to develop those circuit in a single cell, it would be complex. It is very complex and it's probably, we cannot, it is almost impossible for us to develop that. So that's why you took the, uh, the concept of the distributed computing and then we distributed the whole tasks among six different cell types. We engineered different kind of and circuits, the four input and circuits in the four different kind of things. And with that, here is just, uh, we don't have to go through this, but this is the, uh, there's the molecule, there's the gate, there's the how this molecular principles of what is actually happening inside the cell, you know, it's in the circuit, that the design in uh, starting from the promoter, what is the circuit, what is the feedback uh, giving when you are developing the circuits. And we build it, we uh, 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 characterize it, we optimize it in terms of its uh, uh, digital nature and uh, whatever we talk in terms of the noise and so on. And this is the result. Now we can see among this 16, only in the four, three cases, you will see these bacteria are glowing. Another 30 case, another 13 cases, the bacteria are not producing any fluorescence proteins. Now, this picture is not only telling you that uh, what is the solution, but it is also telling you what is the number of the solution I mean, what is the uh, probable number of the solution are possible and what is the probable uh, number of uh, cases where there is no solution. Now, if you want to do this mathematically, this simple problem that how many solutions are there and how many unsolvable problems are there, mathematically it is difficult to do, right? It's not a straightforward calculation. So here, very simply, by using a set of uh, genetic circuits in uh, uh, bacteria, uh, we can actually uh, see uh, this whole thing. So this is uh, very exciting for us because this way, uh, using the distributive computing with the synthetic biology, we can solve an abstract mathematical problem, an abstract computational problem. Okay, it is not the swing that how a device works. So that gives an uh, another way that how uh, the synthetic biology can probably go to solve a lot of computational problem, not just so uh, a device. And uh, uh, we are very happy and uh, I'm just like to say, but this work has just featured, I mean, it is published in SA Synthetic Biology, but this work has been featured in basically in uh, MIT Technology Review. That's an, you probably heard of, this is a world renowned uh, uh, technology uh, magazine. And uh, they have made a, a, a big feature. If you just go to the MIT Technological Review, you can find that an equally bank computer uh, uh, solves uh, the work. I mean, it solves the uh, major uh, distributed the work. Or something that's, that is the title. So if you go to the MIT Technological Review, you basically get that uh, story. Uh, so we are happy um, about that. Now for today, uh, I'm going to finish it uh, at this moment. So here I just talk about that when you have a layering of the circuits, different logic gets inside the cells that is difficult to do practically in biological cells, in a single biological cells. That is why you have to distribute it, the whole computing task among various kinds of the cells. So that it would be one kind of the design criteria which will help synthetic biology to go forward in terms of the complex computation. And the next week, uh, uh, so this is the, now this is the last slide for today, but this is the first slide for the next week. And what I'm uh, going to talk about that, how you use synthetic biology to understand some of the fundamental biological problem. Why Richard Feynman came here? Because once Richard Feynman actually told that what I cannot create, I do not understand. Probably he didn't know about the uh, synthetic biology or something, but, there is synthetic biology not there, but he's talking about uh, the physics itself. So what he says that the understanding of the human knowledge or understanding anything, what is required to actually build things. If we cannot build the things based on that law, that means you do not understand the law. And that's true because when in my first class, when I tried to show this is the Pegasus, but that the wings on the uh, horse, okay? So we may understand that some of the developmental biology, but we cannot build a horse with the wings in it, which basically means we do not understand the developmental biology at that level that when we can grow two wings on a horse, right? So that is that is saying, so, so one way to understand the biology, probably just building things, okay? 
step by step and that synthetic biology can actually show some of the pathways um, uh, in that direction we'll discuss a little bit on that and then we'll talk about the space uh, bioengineering uh, uh, in my rec uh, rest of the uh, next class so uh, i'd like to stop here so if you have any question uh, please ask me So, uh, so I think you don't have any question for today. Uh, uh, so with your no more questions. Okay, yeah. So with the permission, I stop here, and we'll meet uh, meet in the next class. Thank you very much for all.